Welcome to the CEO Stylist Podcast, where two unlikely CEOs come together and rewrite the narrative of what it means to be a CEO stylist. Yavanka Loria and Kirsten Harris are on a mission, giving stylists permission to join the movement of artists breaking the mold of what is meant to be for the hair industry and creating the life and schedule of their dreams. Fast forward through many failed attempts and lessons learned in the process, it's time to level up the playing field. It's time to call BS on what's been done before. Yavanka and Kirsten are ready to share it all, defying the odds of the industry and teaching you how to do the same. Welcome back to the CEO Stylist. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Kirsten, and my darling co-host here is my bestie, Yo. Hey guys, welcome back everyone. We're excited to, to be here again. Well, we are excited and we've got a, a ripper for you today. A little bit controversial, you would say, isn't it? But something that uh, really follows on from last week's potty that we recorded and um, it's really delving into the business side and today's topic is all about knowing your numbers. Whew. All about knowing your numbers and not numbers in the way that everyone's going to think. There is a little bit of um, an approach and awareness that we, we hope that everyone gets value by the end. Um, it's kind of like, have you been seeing a lot of um, the posts where everyone's doing the girl math? The no. application or the, the girl math caption and they're breaking down the cost of um, service and they're breaking it down, say for extension. Oh, yeah. I've seen it in I've seen it in captions. And yeah. then like, girl math, here's the girl math. If, if you break it down, it's this over a month or this oh, over. Oh yeah. A month. Yeah. Well that's really cool and clever. It's it's really taken um taken up on socials and I was like, I need to do one of those too. And they do is that the one where they relate it back to it costs no more than the a cup of coffee a, cup a week of a day yes when you yeah. break it up of how much they're paying to how much it is for a month you know that's the kind of girl math that that we love and it resonates with so many people as well so are you ready to go beyond the math okay I'm ready where are we going to start with this I know that you love this topic just as much as I do absolutely it's kind of like the topic from last week we got off we got off the podcast and we're like, why are we so excited about something so simple like policies and procedures? But it really is, this is the same tone because once you are aware and once you make these changes, it really, really is life-changing. And I know coming from someone, you know, again, I'm an advocate for the stylist, as I know you are, but I yeah. really am that stylist that, and we hear it all the time that, you know, I'm the creative, you know, I just want to do hair. I don't really want to do the numbers. And, um, you know, you've taught me a new way as well. What do you say? It's the fear of n not knowing or the fear of knowing where you stand is what typically gets in the way of of business owners having a look. Having a look. Because and I honestly it's like looking at your bank account after you've been on a massive shopping spree. You, you reframe it so it works for you so you don't really see the truth, right? Or after that dirty night out, you know, you've had a bender and go shit how much did that cost me every time I tapped it's that it is like you know no jokes aside it really is about that and like looking at your bank account is no measure whether that's good bad or indifferent that's not what this is about but I am a huge advocate for small business and coming from my own experience whether or not running someone else's business big small mid-size running teams there's costs associated with that in terms of costs, department costs, business costs. You, you've you got, how many businesses do you have? Technically you have four. three, three, four. So, and it's, it's a constant and you are now in a position where you've got a team that looks into that and bre literally breathes down your neck with it. Of course. And they are the tough conversations, but I think, you know, before we get into it, the biggest shift has been since COVID. I think small business owners are really feeling the pinch. I think everyone is feeling the pinch. It's just whether you own a business or not, it's just that our, I guess our delivery of this podcast is really to business owners. Um, but life's expensive. Running a business is really. You have to continuously course correct. And, you know, it, yeah. it, it's interesting that you say COVID was, it was a blessing and a curse. I know for so many business, everyone has their own experience. Mm. But I for me when you talk about shift the biggest shift happened for me obviously like everyone knows listening to the podcast you know the shift happened for me around hair extensions and when I first started I was at home 
I was that typical hairdresser that didn't understand numbers at all. I knew roughly or what I thought I understood, but, you know, lucky you came into my life and I had amazing, incredible people come into my life at the time who were mentors. And not only that, I had an incredible, smart, smart husband that understood numbers. And you still also, have him, by the way. You didn't have him. I know. I make it sound like <laughs> I just want to be at the forefront Sorry, of the back end of the business. And I keep saying, Dave, you need to come on, on the podcast. He's like, no, you girls are doing a great job. <laughs> Everyone can just call me. But, um, you know, coming back to when things started to take off for us <clears throat> and you were one of the first people that I came to and this is, um, you know, one thing that you brought to my attention and this is what I'm so passionate about is, you know, ATV you know, what that means, which we'll go into ATV. And also I had another mentor that, you know, gave me some good templates on, um, you know, knowing knowing what your break-even costs are. Like, you know, just that notion is, you know, what are your break-even costs? What's your ATV? You go into more like a little bit more like price review and also performance review for your teams. So many different areas in knowing your numbers, which we, we, we can break down a little bit over different episodes because it's a lot to take in. Mm. But do you want to maybe start off by explaining what ATV is? Of course. So it's average client transaction or an average transaction value. That's what the ATV acronym is. Uh, I think most point of sale dashboards might have it as average client spend, um, but everyone will have that measure as if they're using a point of sale. It's just understanding what that lever is in your business. So it's probably from my own experience, you know, running Blow Dry Bar, we came off a really low ATV and you've got staff and overheads and they're pushing for salary increases and all of that. And it's like, how the fuck do you shift the needle on this? I needed to really understand those reports coming into the industry, not growing up in the industry and not having those conversations as a junior, senior, and then owning my own business. I kind of came in and went, I need to understand this. So that was kind of, from my own experience in other industry, that was the first thing that we always looked at. In retail, they look at it. In supermarkets, they look at average trolley spend. So it's it's definitely a, a measure that's really effective in any business. Yeah, so what it means is whether or not run it for a week and then run it for a month. But if you run this report, let's say on a weekly basis, it is what it means is it's the measure, the average spend for the clients for that week. And so you, you'll you find it'll dip and, you know, it'll increase or go up and down. But generally over a six-month period, it should be about the same all along. Like mm-hmm. unless, you're, unless you're making some significant changes in your business mm-hmm. where you've set that as a goal to increase that, you should have it. Now, <clears throat> a few years ago, it was a kind of a dangerous question to ask people in a room like a bunch of, salon owners in a room what is the average because the average is different for everyone it's everyone it it, you know you couldn't compare it's like comparing apples with bananas so it didn't make me feel any better about the business I'll be honest you know but trying to get a I I guess a baseline back a few years ago (laughs) believe it or not because my god the industry has changed. I think back then, about eight or nine years ago, it was like 125 was the average. There was certainly plenty of salons doing more than that. In my business, we were doing way less than that, like less than 50%. Was this so, when you introduced colours? Like, um, absolutely. Like this was when it was just, blo- it was sitting at $49. It was mm-hmm. just like detrimental to that business long term. But, you know, and then there were other salons that were kind of sitting at that 120, 125 mark. And then you had your super salons and, you know, your premium salons that were sitting back then at about 180 was about the mark. Now, fast forward a decade, it's changed significantly. But not only that, we're in this interesting situation where the cost of living has gone up. Mm. And so Mm -hmm. this is like this could be an unpopular opinion or a popular opinion, depending on which side of the fence you're on, uh, do our prices match, one, what we need to pay stylists to keep them working, yeah, yeah so they can afford to live. And the economy as well. And will clients pay 
so we can maintain, will they pay the price so we can maintain these beautiful salons? Mm. So we're going to start with ATV. We've got a lot to unpack, right? Yeah. And we're going to be a little bit high level, I think, because, Mm -hmm. you know, you talk about price reviews, we talk about performance reviews, we talk about benchmarking in small business. There's a lot, there would be a lot that we would cover off. So we want to keep this one short and sharp and, you Mm. know, hopefully our listeners and this yep. is not to make any stylist feel less than because, like I said, I was that stylist only four or five years ago, you know, so we don't want anyone to feel, you know, and here's the thing. I think, you know, we keep saying this to each other. I spent so many years, so many years wasting so many years pretending like I knew instead yeah. of instead of just asking people the right question because I think, it, you know, it's under that umbrella of fear of, you know, feeling like you're stupid or you don't know. And if you don't know, there's nothing wrong with knowing. The way you're going to get to know is by asking, you know, that that questions and being open to it as well because that's the first shift, right? Yeah, well, it is. And, you know, my reflection of, let's say, a decade, it was actually more than a decade ago now I think about it, it was like more like 14 years ago, and looking at the numbers in Blow Dry Bar and feeling really shit about it, going this is the only enjoyment that's happening because I could clearly see stylists weren't enjoying it because they were absolutely flogged to an inch of their life Mm -hmm. to hit some sort of KPI. But, but the only enjoyment was the clients because they were getting a cheap deal, which highlighted to me with the pricing Mm -hmm. as well, which obviously affects your ATV. So Mm -hmm. Tell me about your experience with that. Well, again, it was definitely a big conversation that we'd had. Conversation. It was funny because when I first brought the figures to you, I mean, at that time we had three staff and, again, our ATV was at 120 and when we started implementing extensions, <clears throat> it shot up to, I think at that time, because <clears throat> obviously we've had price increases, but at that time it would have been at 300. So it was such a massive, such a massive difference and here is why we're so passionate about this because this is where you have to make an educated decision about What's going to drive you forward in your business? Mm. Because as stylists, a lot of us are operating without knowing and a lot of us are operating because it's the way that we've always operated. And what so also, operating with, with your eyes closed. Operating, yeah, with your eyes closed because we've never really understood any other way. It was just the conditioning. And so, then it becomes a point where it's like you're too fucking scared to look at it anyway. Well, you're too scared because you don't want to lose a client. Like you say, you're at the beck and call of your clients because they're dictating to you what they want to pay, you know. So ultimately what ends up happening, and this is where I had to make that, it was like an instant shift and that's where my mindset really became to change and that's why we looked at it and we're like, oh, my God, we really have a really clever business model if this can work and if we can implement this in blow dry bar if we can implement this in other businesses this is a game changer and this is why we're so passionate now about sharing it to the wider you know businesses whether they use our product whether they work with us or not because as a whole not only does it raise our businesses it's going to raise the entire industry yeah and it comes down to like you know you were well ahead of the industry trend like you started your business what seven seven years ago right but here's the thing Kurt, it wasn't but now in- it's becoming pop people have said even this year's well 2023 hair expo every third or fourth stand was a hair, hair extension stand because they're realizing and it's not and this is where i want to be really clear because it's not just about the financial gain that is a huge part of it that's the icing on the cake mm-hmm. but what it did for me i think also not just as a mum, but as a stylist that was pushing you know, services and doing multiple clients a day, working on weekends, I had to really rethink the direction that I was going going in because I could clearly see that not only was this benefiting clients, because mm. it really was, it was a whole new way of doing hair. I was able to take less clients and the revenue went up double. Everything went up. Doesn't mean that my expenses didn't go up because that's an- another conversation that we'll have a little bit later down the track. But what ultimately ended up happening is I had to really decide if I was what I was going to do with my clients because I ultimately ended up dropping 98% of my clients. Clients that I've built since I've been, you know, I've had some clients with me back then that I've had when I was like 15 years old. Mm. So imagine, you know, imagine that because it's you yeah. build relationships with them and you're, I hear it all the time, but I love my clients. They've been with me forever. They've been loyal. 
And how do you break that threshold of now you see the numbers, you see the clear direction, because guess what? It's about, it's going to clear up your schedule. It's going to give you the freedom back so that you can make educated decisions. And ultimately, I'm doing this because I want to be able to be there for my family. I so I want, to, I want to stop you right there just for those that haven't ventured into hair extensions. I just want you to explain what the operational difference is from being a traditional colour and cut salon to then going into full, mm-hmm. full hair extensions or well, even implementing the service. What does that mean? When you say less, you probably need to explain why. We'll elaborate. So yeah. obviously the high, it's a high ticket value to start with. So, um, you know, you're taking on less clients because you're charging a lot more for a specialised service. Are you charging more because it's taking longer? Obviously it is, but regardless, once you build up your skill, it's actually taking you less than any other method and it's probably taking you less than having to stand there and having to colour someone's hair back to back, you know, which pretty much used to take the same amount of time, but it was less impact, less reward. Because at the end of the day, for me, no matter how much I coloured, you know, natural hair, normal hair, there was only 30% clients, you know, hair that were genuinely happy with it, not because we weren't good, because natural hair is just, you know, not everyone gets, you know, the cream of the crop clients. What you see on social media is not your everyday clients. You're so true. Right? Yeah. And especially like I was looking at Natalie Ann and Heron Harlow and, you know, their clientele was very different to what clientele I had. I had a very European clientele, to be honest, which my people, they were the biggest pains in the ass because they They wanted that. They wanted, you know, they wanted to be white like there was. They they were just really unrealistic. And once we said, you know, started setting really clear boundaries and and started to really, you know, educate ourselves on colour, we had to be really clear on what we were willing to do and what we weren't willing to do. Same with extensions. It was just a natural progression. Mm. And I think it's a flawed system. You know, some have tweaked it to make it work for themselves because, you know, there's still some amazing colorists that are taking less clients, charging six, seven hundred, yeah. you know, and that, that still works. The ATV is actually probably similar to what we're doing. They probably have oh. to do um, a little bit more. It's kind of the same. So when I'm saying, and I want to be really clear, again, for me, I know because we've got evidence now how it worked for our business. And like I said, it wasn't even me. Um, myself that bought this I was learning from the girls in America which one day they'll one of them will be on this episode because I really it's a full circle moment because um, a couple of them I you know ended up being in partnership and working with somehow um, just through all because it's funny how energy has worked they initially helped me break that cycle and helped me shift my mind mindset because if I didn't have them I probably wouldn't have had the guidance that, you know, we're able to now be for others because it really was a mindset. It was almost like them giving us permission to be like, here, here's how it works. Know your numbers, know your worth, know your value so that you can implement it in your business and make dr- dramatic changes in your life. And do you think it had the same impact in the States when they flipped to this model of hair extensions became a focus? Massive impact. And to be yeah. fair, you know, they're probably even charging a lot more of what we're charging here because it's like any product, you know, like like you say, there's different brands and different services and different demographics, different lifestyles, everyone yeah. can charge different based on location and demographic. But I knew what I was able to do with my product based on numbers and cost and services and experience and education and everything that went into really dialing in of what we needed to charge. We're living proof that it can work. Yeah, and then fast forward like back to what I said before, and I, you know, I haven't been to Hair Expo for a long time, but from from the comments coming back through my clients that went, Mm. there was a very big focus this year on hair extensions, and that kind of made me think. I mean, I know the answer; it's kind of a rhetorical question, but why? Why now? Is it because our focus is on solopreneurs? Is it because you know, business the rising business costs? Uh, and the pressure on small business owners that they need to find income streams that haven't that produce a higher bill mm-hmm. is a diversification in services. Is a China's got really hard us with supplying a lot more. You know, I mean, they're pretty savvy these days. I know when you know we were longtime supporters of 
Yvonne Calori extensions and every day in my DMs would I get invitations from suppliers in China, like who knows who they are, right? Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that that would be very tempting. Now, this is a different topic because it kind of goes a bit off ATV, but the reason why I raise it is it's like, you know, you go to Hair Expo and let's say you've not, like you're you're relatively new to the industry or you've not been before, Mm -hmm. their experience is quite different walking into a place like that. They could live regionally and be a bit disconnected with what's going on out there Mm -hmm. and they walk into an environment like that and there's like 50 million, exaggeration, different extension brands. Mm -hmm. And my concern with this, when we take it back to ATV, cheap is not, the answer necessarily right you've got to you've got to select something that's right for your business but not at the sacrifice of just having a service for the sake of it because you need to follow a trend and it's I got think- to be a good business decision and it's got to create so for me I can make it I, like I'll share my story on why we transitioned from tapes it was the easiest decision as soon as you showed your numbers it was a no-brainer well I went that this this is a no brainer like this is six years ago but it's like this is a no brainer Mm. why would we not do this there is no way our business model not saying that that this is the case for everyone was going to sustain being a color destination because of our name so i knew that we needed to have diversity in services that that had a high that would produce a higher ticket because i knew that you know, ATV is made up of how many clients walk in the door, the services produce with the number of hours. So if you've got your staff that are already working at 90% capacity, which is about the mark, like I, you know, you'd never want them working at 100%. It's not possible, but Mm -hmm. 90, 95% capacity. The only lever you have is your ATV. How you get there is based on services and pricing. Mm. And this, I, I was just very fortunate that I was very lucky. <clears throat> you know, there's a whole backstory. It's not like I just came up with the idea to have a product. It took me years to source this product. Mm. And I was still using um, another hair extension brand, but I quickly also realised with that that you need to have a premium product in, and a premium experience in order to back up your pricing as well. It's not just one fold. Just no, no. Product. There's, you know, multiple layers. <clears throat> of what's going to sustain and what's going to grow that clientele because if you don't have the product to back it up you're going to you're going to flop in certain areas and you're going to piss clients off it's not going to work you know it's you'll end up going backwards i think consumers have become very savvy now you know definitely i guess maybe because we follow a lot of different brands but i think consumers have become very savvy and so the big difference this might be contrary to unpopular opinion i don't think a consumer knows the difference between a good haircut and a great haircut until they've had a bad one until they've had a bad one but I definitely think over time they know the difference between quality hair extensions and shit and and I always say like it's again it's people's personal opinion and what the best decision is for their salon implementing going down the path of implementing a service like this but I knew based on my experience and, and research and we were already sitting in a bandwidth with, uh, you know, tape extensions and the supplies that we were using. We were already charging between six and seven hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars, depending on. But it was what the manpower was to mm. deliver that. That was that was my issue. Mm. And it, it kind of goes down to the same thing when you know when stylists start charging more for their time and for their service and for the experience. It's kind of like a threefold thing that will help determine why you, how you can charge those prices but it's the same goes when you have more time you don't compromise you know your work either so mm. you know that's why before when what stylists don't understand when the double you know double booking triple booking thing you know and I still hear a lot of stylists are, are doing it now when they're not charging because they're just trying to you know, make it at the end of the week. And this is also where it, you know, goes wrong is because the quality of work drops. Mm. So, you know, if we can all help other stylists understand that it's not an emotional decision, it really is a data-driven decision. And you've got to look at what your key drivers are in your business and what's going to move you forward because that ultimately, like I said, numbers is not just about spreadsheets. 
It no, is. it's not. And, you know, yeah. even you say it's not something that you need to look at it every day, but you need to know it at the you end. You need to know it. You need, yeah. to know, you need to know what the benchmarks are. You need to know it so then you can make an educated decision on what direction. Like, so to me, why would I end up, you know, and I had a few male clients. At that point, I would maybe still do a couple of kids. You know, I was just like, sure, I've got time. Instead of being really intentional with where I wanted my business to go based on where I could see the potential, mm. you know, and if I was holding on to those services, and those type of clients, I never would have been able to transition into a full-fledged, you know, extension business or where we are at now in order to provide such massive growth and not just growth for me but also growth for, for my team. So what you're saying is the impact of doing the lower-priced services like men's haircuts, kids' haircuts, drags your ATV down. It which just drags it down and keeps you spinning yeah. in circles by the end of the week. That's what part of burnout is. Yeah, and it's like it's the you know the acquisition cost of getting that new client as well. So, you know, we commonly see it, I guess, from a marketing perspective. When if if your strategy is to um, acquisition of clients is through promotions, it's fine. Like I think that they have their place, mm -hmm. um, but always know that that's going to be the one thing that will impact your ATV. Mm. So if you're serving the same amount of clients from one week to the next, but the difference is you have a promotion that's generating a lot of business, you know, like you might, your long-term strategy might be to be able to hang on to those clients, which I'm totally fine with. But if you are doing a bums on seat campaign, that's mm. never going to get you to your ATV goal. Correct. And you're not, yeah. unless you have that awareness, you're not going to be able to make you know, a smart business decision and, you know, it all comes down to once you're aware of it, you automatically see that shift. You'll know what levers to pull You to know get what levers yeah. to pull, then you know yeah. what strategy to pull, then you know it all, you know, falls into, you know what, you know, you might have to do a model in the beginning or a couple of models, which we all, you know, did um, in the beginning to get to build up the skill or to build up that content or to build up, you know, your confidence with what you want to promote and put out into the world. Yeah, so that's kind of how you make that transition. Obviously, it goes a little bit deeper, um, you know, and also I have to say, like, I didn't get it right in the beginning. Like, in the beginning, I lost a really good staff member because I didn't understand what I was doing with KPIs because this is a whole new thing. Like, we knew our KPIs from back in the day was always three and a half times your wage, but it was never explained in detail the way that it should be explained now. So this is what we want to challenge other business owners and, and um stylists to understand on both parts how it works because as a salon owner you know like I said I lost I'll go into what happened you know I lost a staff member because she had come from a salon um um down is it down south or up south I always get them confused up south where you know these the you know the stylists there were really doing their 12 hour day you know the amount of clients that they were doing at the end of the day and then when they looked at their figures they're like oh my god we haven't even made anything so here, here she is fast forward doing you know going from 45 clients a week to only 20 clients a week you know at that point we were still do, dabbling a little bit with color clients and trying to move over to um, extension clients but she was doing um you know we went down from doing six clients a day to two or three clients a day and it was on a Saturday and she, the salon coordinator at the time, ended up booking um, a relift in with her, squeezed, well, not squeezed, just moved something around. I can't remember exactly how it happened, but mm -hmm. ended up booking a third client in that day and she had a, a little tizzy and complained and was like really pissed off that she had to do um, an extra client, God forbid, you know, doing three clients on a Saturday, coming from where she was coming from. And, you know, my girls at that point, never at that time they still were never finishing overtime you know that's one thing that I was super proud of and I was still tweaking the KPIs but I never articulated to her the KPIs and she was getting pissed and then when it when the information came to me how do you think I felt I was getting pissed I couldn't see it for what it was mm -hmm. that you know I take that as a lesson on myself because I should have been the leader but you know at the end of the day I was still learning and so what was the impact on her? So so instead of client, what she, did it mean to her day? Well, she just got pissed off that she had to do an extra client. This is where. But it was in her paid working hours. It's not like you asked her to work back till midnight. Okay. It was just because this is what I really think happened. I mean, we we parted ways and I, I, we didn't end up speaking because it didn't end up on good terms because she got pissed. I got pissed off 
and I wish I had handled it different. That's where, you know, I'm a big girl now and I can, I can say I've learned a lot from that. It actually helped me implement the systems that I needed in order for this not to happen again. But what happened at that point, I ended up calling her and was like, hey, you know, why did you, you know, what was the, what was the issue? What was the problem? And she just went, she was deflecting instead of being real and telling me. So she was saying one thing to another stylist, saying one thing to me, and then it became a shit show. And I was like, look, at the end of the day, you know, here here is where I'm going to unpack and here is where I'm coming from. At the end of the day, if you can't do three clients on a Saturday, then what are you even doing here? Mm. And that's exactly what I said, which pissed her off even more, and she ended, she ended up resigning in a text. But what, oh, I, wow. what, I, what I think happened, and one day I hope that we get to meet again, and what happened, I mean, I heard obviously, you know, what she was saying to the other girls because what was really happening is don't forget these girls started to do, you know, two and a half, three thousand dollar appointments, clients. So in their head, in their brain, they would have thought, hey, I'm doing a three thousand dollar client. Why aren't I getting paid more? And I know exactly that would have been a massive thing because again it's the not knowing and a little bit of ego a little bit of entitlement a little bit of not understanding how it works because here's the thing and I say to my girls it's not just about doing one client and making two three thousand it really is um you know you have to it's a continual consistent thing that you have to deliver on that not just doing one client because at the end of the day if I was um more transparent about the numbers and the figures she would have understood she would have understood how it worked got it so so in her mind she's only basing her judgment on her past experiences that she knew somewhere around the mark her kpi was between three and four thousand and because she did a client that was worth the ticket that was that she thought that well why do i need to do anything more because i've 100% 100% and I'm, yeah, yeah okay there's definitely lessons in that isn't there and there was a, and this yeah. was at the very beginning you know where we yeah. went and I'm, I'm so open about our figures like we went from making 7,000 to 12,000 to 15,000 with three staff yeah you know? so when they see the figures and this is what you know what's so important and I feel like this is a massive disconnect as well because it comes from the stylist and it also comes from the salon owners it's both of us because here's a here's a stylist thinking they're looking and it's happened we speak we speak to businesses all the time these kids are looking at what the salon's bringing in the revenue at the end of the week they're not crunching the numbers and looking at the expenses they're not looking at the detail you know when you sit down staff like now I do because I need them to understand exactly what's involved how the numbers work how it's allocated because yes Um, this opportunity that we all had was growing the business but staff think oh my god I'm growing her bank account I'm growing Mm. her life I'm not growing the business because at the end of the day and it's pretty much happens still because everyone sees on the outside that we're expanding and we're growing but they don't actually look at you know that's part of business growth and that's part of the decision and the key drivers of why we're growing to be able to invest back in the business to be able to benefit not just us but it's really benefiting the business the clients the team it's benefiting everyone but they don't really see that and I think what happened with COVID is that they go off and they're like hey I can make that money on my own right it happens and they're like then they go open up a lot of them during COVID went up and opened up their own home salon which is fine it's exactly what I did but this is what we're saying it's not a bad thing but still know your numbers because we just didn't do it through COVID you were already COVID, but I knew because I, I come from high end salons, so I cop shit from a lot of my friends going, "Why the fuck are you opening up a home salon?" Because it just had that 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 irk about home salons. Because it's of course true. the stigma back it's, then. I mean, we've come a long way. We've evolved. Yeah, and, you know, I still challenge it because a lot of these salon owners, which we hear all the time, are undercharging because they don't know their numbers, because they don't understand. So they've all, a lot of them have gone from high end salons. They're now opening up at home and they're like, well, I'm at home now. I'm so like, I can charge less. So I can charge less, but they've got the experience. They've been doing hair for 15, 20 years. It doesn't matter how long. It just really baffles me because this is what's really hurting our industry. Mm. And that we are, I know that we have a future plan to talk more about that topic, We're the really- impact of COVID and navigating this as business owners. But I want to bring it back to pricing and talking about KPIs and that experience you have with that staff member. 
Do you think the avoidance from your perspective was because you didn't quite understand back then? Uh, and so I take full yeah. ownership, full responsibility because I was, you know, at, at that point you came into my life and I, and Vlad, my husband, wasn't in the business. So not only was I having to run the salon, I was running social media, I was running yeah, um, a lot. I had a lot. I was trying to run education at that point. I was, um, you know, doing the accounts. I was pretty much, you know, raising the kids because Vlad was out at that point, you know. We had to, so it was a lot for me. I had to do everything, um, you know, at my own pace. And you just needed people just to do their job. Don't ask about the numbers. numbers. I, just I service the clients and keep them happy. And, it'll and at that point, right. I didn't even understand my vision. I didn't. All I knew is that I had something amazing that I knew one day I was going to help a lot of stylists mm. but I just you know because I wasn't <clears throat> articulating or communicating my vision my ideas it just got taken the wrong way and now so what is your what is your uh advice, advice for our listeners that us that are salon owners or even I guess even for staff as well if they're in a position where because it's equally their responsibility as well, right? 100%. If they don't understand what their KPIs are, ask. Mm, uh, ask, ask your yeah, boss. Genuinely, clients, like now now when I show my stuff, they genuinely get so excited about them because it yeah. gives them something. It makes them, you know, it holds them accountable. You have to hold. That's how you have a successful business is when you hold people accountable. Absolutely. Their expectations. Yeah. They want to work towards something. So yeah. I feel like now the best advice is once you know it, um, you know, it takes time. Like I said, don't be afraid. They've got people in their corner. Like you're one amazing person within our um, education as well. We touch on all that as well. Like I'm such an open book. You know, just the other day I was speaking to one of our stockers who's now coming on to work with me um, as a client and you as well. And she will be on the podcast one day. And we were speaking about ATVs as well. And she was saying they're sitting on 170 as well and when she saw ours and she's like I love that you're so transparent I'm like yeah because I have to be here's the evidence we we made a pact that if this was going to work in our businesses we needed to be an open book and yeah. be able to show other business owners how this can work so um, I will get back to your question I haven't forgotten about your question but this is just a segue because um you know she has her own story as well and why she she had such a successful business with 12 staff, I won't reveal who it is because one day she will come on to speak about it. And she's like, yes, yes, we need to because we don't often speak about it as business owners. And same thing sort, sort of happened to her as well where she was so busy, her and her sister were running the business and they had over 12 staff. But at the end of the day, they got so busy and then with COVID, things went quiet. quiet. So they were also pulling their weight to pay for their staff. And here are their staff demanding more pay, demanding to get paid you know, why they're working 15 minutes overtime. And here's where she's like, fuck this. I'm not doing this anymore. Mm. And even the other day when she saw her ATV, she's still got a small salon. She's like, thank God you showed me that because this is what I manifested. This is the answer. Mm. It really is the framework and the blueprint. And this is why in answer to your question, finally, this is why. What was that question? <laughs> what's our advice to other business owners oh yeah okay yeah about kpis yeah KPIs, but yeah. this is now on a whole nother level because kpis were always like this is what you needed to make and here's how you get there by upselling upsell this upsell that you know you need to hear like back in the day the kpis were so un unattainable there was very few that could do it because you're either going to sink or swim right and that upsell concept remember when you first came i was oh. like i was so I was so Contrary to um, this could be an unpopular opinion. I didn't. I never. I've never been comfortable with it. I respect it. Mm -hmm. I totally respect it. Mm -hmm. But I'm we're in this situation that. now where consumers they can go and buy retail wherever they want, right? Mm -hmm. And like the upsell was of upsell is is the upsell to line a back pocket is the upsell for the betterment of the client. And my theory was always right. don't sell them something they don't need. Here's, here's the thing. I feel like this system was implemented by a bunch of smart businessmen who implemented the system. You know, you go out and that. Or well, not just upselling this, this system of the structure of salons. And, you know, you go back to the Tony and Guy days and, you know, um, other big businesses that were implementing that, you know, I feel like the smaller businesses were taking this on. That's where it's all come from. So they were high-level business businessmen here yeah. and emotional stylists who just want to do their job because they love their clients and love their work. And, you know, 
we're going to meet somewhere in the middle because I'm I'm very much the same. Like I I never use that word upsell. I'm no, like, I know. But so many businesses, like I know we're doing a massive course next year in February, right? And signing up to that, there is upsell. I have a healthy respect for Macca's do it. You know, the what's their golden line? Do you want fries with that? You want dessert? Do you want apple pie? It, like I get the concept of upsell. I think we lost sight of it in our in the industry where we're recommending shit that people don't need. I agree. But when because we've done a, I've done that course. We, we're going to see Kerwin Ray in February to do a little bit of that. But I've and he's the king of upsell, right? He is, but the way he reframed it changed my opinion of it. Right. Because he has a sales process that really isn't salesy. Mm. And that's that's the most important thing. If you can get away from it being salesy, nothing wrong with upselling. 100%. I just don't yeah. know the word, but I've yeah. put it in my core structure because it, it is at the end of the day. It's not about selling. It's giving people what they need. Yes, yeah. You know, as whereas before it wasn't very much like that. It was like you saw that treatment, you upsell. And remember before we had to bloody take, and I hated doing this, we were expected to speak about shampoo, upseller treatment, speak about the freaking shampoo or what we were using. It was almost badgering it down there while they're trying to relax. Then you have to go like a little pork chop, carry those shampoo bottles and stick it right in front of them. Oh, yeah. I like I had someone in my business and I love and adore her still. I won't mention her name. But when I first started at Blow Dry Bar, she was the queen of upsell and she, there was no one better than her in teaching the teams how to do it like she was freaking amazing and she, is she did she probably end up selling like she like she's tony and guy background they're freaking amazing like I've, amazing and i used to sit there and go you just you just have such a knack like i just don't think at, the majority could meet that when you reframe it and you see it just depends i guess you know looking back now because it was it wasn't explained properly as whereas now there's so many businesses that have NLP specialists come in and that speak to their teams about sales. So it's it's unpacking the psychology of it behind. I think if it's presented in the right way, people will take it a lot more on board. Absolutely. Than, yeah, yeah, just need to make your figures. Well, to the point where, like from my own experience, transitioning to a hair extension salon, it required upselling, let's yeah. use that word, it required that clients didn't know yet that they they needed this or wanted it. We had to sow the seed, and mm. that's what would be a great idea for them. So, in effect, you are selling. It's just the, as you say, it's the technique. Let's segue this into price increase because I mean, yeah, touch on it as well. The third part of it. This is the yeah. The, the, there's so many parts to it, but you know, this segues into price increase. Um, you know, like or pricing in general, pricing in general. But when you have a price increase, you know, like like we say, a lot of stylists feel like they have to apologize for price increase or they have to over justify their price increase. Yeah. So well, let's take it back. Can we go to pricing first and then we'll touch on okay. price increase? So I, I want to speak first about this from just from a general perspective that talking to different salon owners across Australia. It was always a very interesting topic how people define their pricing. Gut feel, that's the industry standard, typical response. That's what, you know, in the area, we couldn't get away with charging any more than that. We can get away with plenty. Mm. Like there was no real benchmark from salon to salon, location, whether or not you had the it and a bit stylist working for you, they could command a higher price, mm -hmm. whether or not you're east, west, north, south of Victoria, because I spent 20 years in Melbourne, so that's where I gained my knowledge um, initially. And it's like how the freak does anyone in that's starting a business, where, where do they get their pricing from? Because it didn't come from any science from what I could See, I went on and did a pricing course, which was freaking amazing. Mm. Thanks, Al Keely. I'm going to plug him for this because that was that an eye-opener going, oh, my God, someone's actually showing me the mm. proper way uh, to price. But but there was no real benchmark mm. across the board, mm -hmm. generalising. Yeah, 100%. And basing it on your demographic, on your expenses, there's so many different variations. So... And I get that a lot of stylists are basing it on purely on what such and such is doing down the road or what, 
you know, they think the industry standard, there's no, there's no um, process behind them getting to those numbers. No, I, it was the it was the best experience I had actually truly understanding how to price the service mm. like properly, not and taking away from the fact of what Mary's offering down the road for a full head of foils toner cut blow dry. Like it was just completely different. And I imagine it's the same by the way in the beauty industry as well. Like it's not, it's got to be based on your numbers and your numbers alone. Cost of goods, wages you know, operating costs, they are different from shop front to shop front. Of course, marketing, if you're doing marketing, if you're, you know, doing education, like there's so many different factors, your experience, your time, there's so many different factors. And once you now go to price increase, what were you going to say about that? Price increase, I was going to say, because it's a big thing, and, you know, we share it in our um, in our education, how yeah. they let their clients know, because you see it a lot and there's a big debate now on social media as well where you see people. Wait, do you or don't you? Tell yeah, your client. Do you or don't you uh, put in, you know, or justify why your uh, prices are increased? Increase. Well, first of all, do you tell? I know, I know you've had, you did have a significant increase through COVID oh, yes. because of you yeah. know, coming out of COVID. But here's, here's my take on it. The way that I always delivered the price increase, it was a place of knowing and it was a place coming from experience and it was a place coming from, from business growth. It was never, it was never, hey, here are my price increases because, um, you know, my electricity has gone up or, um, um, you know, you keep it loose and effective. But I think, I, I don't know if, if you agree with this, I feel like in hair in the hair industry, we're the only, only ones that are over-justifying it. Like I don't, see, I don't see the supermarket sending people emails when they put their price increase or the petrol station or the doctors or I don't think anyone ever really sends emails, do they? If they have no. increased. Well, I, I mean, I can tell you from industries, other industries I've worked in outside of service based industries, that this is, I will not name brands, but there's one significant brand in Australia that you could go from store to store and there's different pricing. Why? Mm. The overheads are different. There are, it, 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 not, all- their cost of goods might not be any different, but their operating costs are different. Wages, you know, their general operating costs are. So therefore price is reflected that way. And I have a healthy respect for that because you've got some science behind why you've got that price. But I think here's the the key thing. If you're going to communicate it in a way where you're delivering the increase based on the growth of your business, not, you know, the growth of your of your bills really at the end of the day. And I think also be really like assertive and don't make excuses and don't feel like you're apologizing because you're going to put that energy out and that's mm. what you're going to attract back. If you put that energy, you're going to attract clients that are going to question you on it. I know when I had to really make that that decision and I sent out, you know, an email, and that's how I addressed it first and I was like very clear, like, hey, guys, I love you all. I really appreciate you supporting me, but this is the direction that I've decided to go in. You know, I, I, I really love our experience together and our time together. It's not personal, but this is what I'm doing and here's my price increase. If you wish to stay with me, because I knew it was so high, I had to match it to what I was doing with extensions. Here's my new price increase. If you're happy to go ahead, I'd love to see you again. But if not, I completely understand and I'm happy to even help you find another stylist that suits, you know, suits where you want to go, suits your budget. And I kind of just kept with that same notion as well. And very clearly, you know, most of my clients were so supportive that by the mm. time that they sat in the chair, they didn't question it. And to this day, I still get lovely messages from them that have moved on to other stylists, you know, that now, you know, um, are seeing someone else. But they're still so supportive because it's done in a way that you've been able to communicate it without over-explaining yourself or justifying yourself. I and think- so what you're saying is the clients will figure out for themselves whether or not they can, it fits within their budget. 100%. That's perfectly fine. I don't, I have like, I'm a little on the fence. If you have a dramatic change, so I know that I'm working with a couple of clients at the moment on um, tiered pricing, which is not, which is, will be new. So I definitely believe there's a space to be able to communicate, communicate that to clients and then they can nominate whether or not they'll continue with that salon or that stylist. Like it wasn't designed to get rid of clients by no means, but it's another way to improve the ATV through tiered pricing. So I do believe 
communicating. But if you do an annual price review and it's a very small incremental change, I don't think you need to shine the light on that so much. I don't think, as to your point, we're not notified. The only common notification that we get right now is through rate increases because they have a legal obligation to tell us. But they certainly don't tell us when the price of milk goes up or, you know, a kilo yeah. of bananas goes up. Yeah, that's true. We just have to cop that. It's such and we'll make a choice where we shop for food and, you know. Mm. I think also for me, as, as a business owner, I've always just been respectful and just wanted to communicate it just to let people know. Because hmm. it's yeah. worse than them rocking up to the appointment because they've budgeted for, for that appointment. So that's my only thing. It, it doesn't mean that you're asking for their permission. It means you're just communicating it so that they're aware because, you know, there's nothing, like I said, you know, when clients rock up and, you know, you're going to you're gonna be caught out. If, I feel like if you don't tell them because then, then they're going to say, well, I, you know, unfortunately I budgeted for this. So that's, I feel like, where it can get a bit murky. Okay. Interesting. That's a, that's a good perspective on it. So in wrap up, because we're going to wrap this up, it, one thing I want to say, I think that we need to dedicate a podcast to let's talk about pricing and we're going to come from, um, I guess, an emotional point of view about value and self-worth because I think that's a whole topic in itself which does impact. And I know from my own experience, I know you've had experiences talking to your clients as well, I'm talking your stockers clients where, you know, staff make a decision to discount services because they don't feel like they can charge more. So I feel like we're going to do a podcast on that one. Yeah. In wrap up though, I think, you know, to give some homework to our listeners, some cool homework, and we'd love to get your feedback on it and help in any way that we can is to go and have a look if you don't know what your ATV is, because I think you should know what the ATV is for the salon and then break it down. If you employ a team, break it down and have a look at your team and see what the variation is per stylus. Mm -hmm. And you may or may not have the answers as to why there's a variation that will obviously come from if you've got tiered pricing, if you've got juniors that don't contribute to the, the turnover as well, that will also impact your ATV. So definitely do that. Have a look at your dashboard. We'd love to get your feedback on that. I'm going to give you a little plug here because I, you know, if people, you know, because we're, we're just so, you're so humble, we're so humble. We're not like, we know everything. But if you really do, if, if anyone out there really needs help, this is your jam. This is what you do. This yeah. Is you can also. Comes from really bad experience. So let's be, let's be honest. You know, as well, I came in like that going forward. <laughs> Fail forward. If you're not failing, you're not learning. Absolutely. So yeah, it's, you know, understand for, for all our listeners, whether or not you're employed or you're the employer, please make sure those KPIs for your performance uh, levers are in place for your team. And as a, as if listeners out there, you're employed, go and ask your boss if you don't know what that number is. Exactly. It's a really good conversation to have. I tell you what, if anyone in my business had come to me and said, what's my KPI? I would have just like loved that. The fact you yeah, know, that's 100%. a really Enjoy. proactive way of approaching it. Exactly. And then the third thing is pricing. Go back, look at your numbers. If you need help, reach out, reach out. We're here. We can offer some some guidance, but not from a financial perspective. That's got to be obviously with your accountant, but definitely happy to have a chat to you guys about it. Um, but at the very least, have a look at your numbers because I would start there. And this is a good time to start reviewing it. You know, go, going into 2024, we've got, We've got some big costs. Can I just say one more thing? Sure. I know we need to wrap up because we've just had such a mundane topic, but I really want to say, you know, this is what we encourage you to look and go a little bit deeper. I was taking my mum to the to the hospital the other day um, and we were at the hospital and I had to drop her off at the front. I had to circle around because there was no car parks for 10 minutes and she listens to the radio station. Mind you, I haven't listened to media or radio for so long and for 10 minutes, all I heard was the economy, fear, rises, prices. Oh, yeah. So I know it's scary, but honestly, when you block out the noise, it doesn't have to be scary because it's a testament to our business. Even in the time where we've, we've been quiet, I shit myself. I was like, oh, my God, is luxury service going to be around? But let me tell you something. Our bottom line is never really affected. And yeah. well, thank God we don't, thank God I don't watch the news. You probably, there's so many people out there, I'm not saying, but, you know. I watch the news. I'm the current affair. I know I've quoted current affair in one of our 
previous episodes where we talked about minimum wages, right? Yeah, that's where you can add a little bit of um, texture to the conversations. For someone like me, I just warn people, just don't buy into the, the media. No. Don't buy into the media fear because this is a good time to review. We're a luxury service. We're still standing. We're still growing. You know, I've got a team of six and I just, you know, took on another apprentice um, last week. So and we've and- got to figure out a way to hold staff and build an industry where we continue to employ and promote people through the industry. We have to figure that, that exactly. out. And uncover the stories that are maybe blocking you to even look. You know, so with that being said, I hope that we've brought some value. Reach out if you guys have any questions or if there's any other specific topics you want us to cover around this subject. And I've got one more request. (laughs) One more. And review us. Give us a five-star review if you love this. Nice. Yeah, thank you. you. Come on, guys. (laughs) Come on, they all DM us and tell us that they love (laughs) us. It would be really nice if you just put it out there for us as well. Yeah, thank you for listening and until next week, we'll see you around. See you guys. See you, Kirsten. I'll see you after. Bye.